body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the studio by my producer, Joel. And today, we've got an absolutely wild one for you. We're going to be covering a real-life monster and serial killer named Dorothea Puente and her house of death. This is an insane story, so buckle up. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to remind everybody I'm launching another podcast called Planet Sleep. So for all of you that are falling asleep to lights out, aren't we all? (laughs) I don't know how you do it, and I'm sure your subconscious hates you, but I've got a new show that I'm launching on July 26th that's going to be all based around nature, calming music, and just sounds of the natural world that I think you'll really like. And Joel and I have been working very hard on it over the past couple of weeks, getting some of the first episodes done. We're going to take you all over the world to visit a lot of beautiful places and talk about a lot of beautiful landscapes and creatures in the process. So I'm very excited about it. If you're not already subscribed to Planet Sleep, if that sounds like something you might be interested in, we'll put all the links below for you. But again, the first episode drops on July 26th. And that'll be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and we also have a YouTube channel because this podcast will be a little bit different from my others. I will not be on camera for this podcast. This is purely an audio podcast. However, Joel is working up a video version of the podcast, which will feature stunning scenery and basically allow you to transport yourself visually to the places we talk about, uh, which will be a really relaxing experience. Absolutely. We've, uh, We've got the first episode pretty much wrapped up and... I'm really excited to see what everybody thinks about it. Yes, me You've too. You've done a killer job on it, so thank you for that. But yeah, we'll put all the info for Planet Sleep below. Also, this episode is brought to you by Stamps.com, Care of, and HelloFresh. But let's not waste any more time because we have got to dive into the story of this absolute monster named Dorothea Puente. So Dorothea Puente was actually born Dorothea Helen Gray. On January 9, 1929, in Redlands, which is a city in Southern California near San Bernardino. She was the sixth of seven children to parents Trudy Mae Yates and Jesse James Gray. Her parents were both abusive alcoholics, and Jesse was emotionally unstable and actually threatened to kill himself multiple times in front of his kids. He also worked as a cotton picker, but spent most of the money he made on alcohol. And from the time that she was very young, Dorothea and her siblings were left to fend for themselves as they had to scrounge through garbage in order to find food. Otherwise, they didn't eat that day. When Dorothea was just eight years old, her father passed away from tuberculosis. Her mother then lost custody of all the children afterwards and then died not much later in a tragic motorcycle accident. Dorothea and her siblings were separated at that point, and she lived in an orphanage for a while, where she later said she was sexually abused. Eventually, she was sent to live with relatives in Fresno, California. By the age of 16, she was on her own, living in Olympia, Washington. She worked part-time in an ice cream parlor and lived in a motel room with a friend where they made extra money doing sex work. And while she did this, she went by the alias Sherry. Dorothea often made up fake names and stories about her childhood. Maybe she was avoiding revisiting the trauma from her past, or maybe she did it to hide her real identity. Who knows? Sometimes it seemed like she lied just to make herself seem more interesting to people. She often told people that she had 17 siblings and was born and raised in Mexico, not the United States. She claimed that she lived through the Bataan Death March during World War II and the bombing of Hiroshima, and that the ambassador to Sweden was her brother. She was always fascinated with acting and sometimes told people she had starred in movies usually casting herself as the female antagonist. She also claimed that actress Rita Hayworth was a close personal friend of hers. While living in Washington, Dorothea met 22-year-old Fred McFall. He was a soldier and had just gotten back from the Pacific Theater of World War II. 16 years old, at the time of meeting him, she introduced herself to Fred as a 30-year-old Sheriel A. Rosselli, and the two got married in Reno in 1946. But it didn't take long for Fred to figure out that his new bride had in fact lied about her identity. Despite this, over the next few years, they had two daughters and moved into a house in Gardnerville, Nevada to raise their family. 
Fred was increasingly frustrated with Dorothea's expensive taste and apparent dissatisfaction with her life as a wife and mother. According to Fred, Dorothea took off in 1948, shortly after they had their second daughter. She then went to Los Angeles where she got impregnated by another man. She had a miscarriage and by then, Fred was finally fed up and left her. His mother took in one of their daughters and the other was put up for adoption. Dorothea moved back to California and told people her husband had died of a heart attack just a few days after they got married. Looking for a new way to make money, she started forging checks. That spring, she bounced a check in San Bernardino trying to buy a pair of shoes, a hat, a purse, and pantyhose. She pled guilty to two counts of forgery when she was caught and was ultimately sentenced to a year in jail. She was then paroled after serving just four months and immediately skipped town, breaking her parole to move to San Francisco. She had a tough few years and ended up pregnant again, and she gave birth to a daughter and put her up for adoption. In 1952, she married her second husband, a Swedish merchant seaman named Axel Bren Johansson. Their marriage was rough from the start, and Axel didn't like that Dorothea spent so much time out drinking and gambling. And by this time, she had a new alias. When she went out, she introduced herself as Taya Singohela Nayarda, an Egyptian and Israeli Muslim. Axel traveled a lot for his work, and while he was out of town, Dorothea frequently brought men home. Their neighbors would actually notice taxis dropping off strangers at all hours of the day and night. And sometimes Axel came home from a long trip to find a strange man living inside his home, which inevitably led to a violent fight. He and Dorothea continued their tumultuous relationship for years, breaking up and getting back together multiple times. In 1960, she was arrested at a brothel in Sacramento by an undercover police officer, and some reports say she was running a bookkeeping firm as a front for the brothel. Others say she was just working at the brothel when she was arrested. Either way, she told the police she was only there to visit a friend. However, the story didn't work, and she was sentenced to 90 days in jail. After her release, she was arrested again for vagrancy almost immediately and spent another 90 days in jail. In 1961, Axel had her committed to DeWitt State Hospital for a psychological evaluation, and he claimed he could no longer control her as she was binge drinking nonstop and had tried to kill herself multiple times. At the hospital, the psychiatrist said she was a pathological liar with an unstable personality. Once she was released, she found legitimate work as a nurse's aide, caring for elderly and disabled people in their homes. In 1966, Dorothy and Axel finally got divorced. And using a new alias with her ex-husband's last name, she started managing boarding houses as Sharon Johansson. And she presented herself as a devout Christian and committed caregiver for women in poverty and the victims of domestic abuse. By 1968, she had opened her own halfway house for recovering addicts called the Samaritans, which ended up leaving her in $10,000 worth of debt. Around the same time, she met her next husband, Roberto Puente, who was 19 years younger than her. But that didn't stop her. They got married in Mexico City in 1968. Dorothea was 39 and Roberto was 21. The age difference was a problem right away, as they fought constantly and she accused him of cheating on her with younger women. They ended up separating after just 16 months together, and when she tried to serve him divorce papers, Roberto fled to Mexico. Their divorce was finalized in 1973, but they continued seeing each other on and off. In 1975, Dorothea filed a restraining order against him, and they split for good. Yet again on her own, Dorothea made the next big move in her career. She took over a three-story, 16-bedroom care home at 2100 F Street in Sacramento, California. And her reputation with the tenants varied widely. Some claimed she was kind and a generous woman who took good care of them, including providing multiple homemade meals per day. However, Others resented her for being stingy with food and other supplies and claimed she opened their mail and even stole their money. Dorothea married one of her tenants in 1976, her fourth husband, Pedro Angel Montalvo, who was a violent alcoholic. He was annoyed by Dorothea's spending habits 
later saying she wanted to wear a brand new pair of pantyhose every day as if she were a wealthy woman. Some reports say he left her after only one week, while others claim he stuck around for at least a few months. But once Pedro was out of the picture, Dorothea started spending more and more time in local bars. She was a nice looking woman and always wore expensive designer clothes, so she had no problem attracting men. She used her natural charm and warm demeanor to get information from them, targeting those who had generous pensions. In 1978, she was caught forging checks again and charged with 34 counts of treasury fraud. A psychiatrist interviewed her and diagnosed her with schizophrenia. She was then sentenced to five years of probation and court-ordered counseling and was ordered to pay $4,000 in restitution. In 1981, she rented an upstairs apartment at 1426 F Street in downtown Sacramento. And this boarding house was owned by Ricardo Ordorico, who didn't know Dorothea was on probation or anything about her criminal history or past. The following spring, her friend and business partner, 61-year-old Ruth Monroe, moved into the apartment with her. Ruth's husband was terminally ill and living at a veterans administration hospital. The two women had started a business together running a lunchroom and decided it made sense to live together as well. In April 1982, Ruth brought all her clothes and possessions and $6,000 in cash and moved into the upstairs apartment with Dorothea. She wrote to her husband and told him how excited she was about their business and that she was hopeful that they had a bright future ahead. Two weeks later, Ruth was at the beauty parlor and ran into a friend. And as they chatted, she abruptly said, I feel like I'm going to die. Her friend was surprised and asked her why, thinking maybe she might have felt sick. But all Ruth could say was, I don't know. 17 days after moving in with Dorothea, Ruth was found dead. She had overdosed on Tylenol and codeine. Dorothea told the police that her friend had been terribly depressed lately because her husband was terminally ill, and the coroner had no reason to believe anyone had hurt Ruth and ruled her death a suicide. About a month later, the police returned to Dorothea's apartment with an arrest warrant, and four men had accused her of slipping them drugs and then robbing them. A 74-year-old man named Malcolm McKenzie said he met Dorothea in a bar called the Zebra Club, and while the two were there together, they enjoyed a few drinks and then went back to his place. Once he got there, though, he started to feel dizzy and disoriented and realized she must have put something in his drink. Whatever she gave him was so strong that he was unable to move or even speak, and he had to watch helplessly as she ransacked his house. She stole his rare penny collection and pulled a diamond ring right off of his finger, but she didn't get away with it. On August 18, 1982, Dorothy was convicted of three charges of theft and sentenced to five years in prison. The judge didn't take her criminal history into account, though, and opted for a much lighter sentence than she could have gotten for these crimes. Dorothea adapted easily to life behind bars. She had a lot of experience at this point of winning people over with her wit and charm. She was also known as a riveting storyteller who entertained the other inmates with stories about her fascinating life on the outside. After a fight broke out among a few inmates, she ended up telling a guard who attacked first, which was a big mistake because shortly after she was attacked and severely beaten for being a snitch. After this though, she was transferred to protective custody and with no one to talk to, she grew bored and restless. All that changed when she received an unsolicited letter from an elderly man named Everson Gilmuth, who had a hobby of writing letters to women in prison. He told his new pen pal that he was retired in Oregon and he lived off a generous pension and owned his own Airstream camper. And that was enough for Dorothea and they developed an intimate relationship through their letters, and Everson fell madly in love. Dorothea had again been diagnosed with schizophrenia by a state psychologist, who noted she seemed to be incapable of feeling remorse or regret, and should be closely monitored. Still, it wasn't enough to keep her locked up, as she was released in September 1985 after serving only three years of her five-year sentence. On the day of her release, Everson was there waiting to take her home in his shiny red 1980 Ford pickup truck. Her former landlord, Ricardo Ordorica, welcomed her back into the upstairs apartment at 1426 F Street. Everson then moved in with her and soon the couple was engaged in planning their wedding. He wrote to his sister to tell her the wonderful news and gushed about his future bride. Ricardo soon offered to rent the couple the entire house for a mere $600 a month and Dorothea could take in her own tenants and run a boarding house again. 
The conditions of her release were to keep her distance from the elderly and not working or volunteering with them in any capacity, as well as to never handle government checks issued to other people. But Ricardo didn't know any of this. Everson didn't hesitate to add Dorothea to his checking account and start making the monthly payments. They then rented out the rooms on the first floor and took the entire second story for themselves. Dorothea started making improvements to the house and property right away, and she diligently tended to the garden and was very protective of the lawn. If someone walked on the grass or got too close to the garden, she would shoo them away and yell obscenities at them if they didn't leave. A few months later, in November 1985, she hired a handyman named Ishmael Flores to install wood paneling inside the home. Instead of paying him for the job, she offered to sell him her fiancé's pickup truck for only $800. She said Everson was in Los Angeles and didn't need the truck anymore. So Ishmael agreed, thinking he was getting a bargain. Dorothea asked him for one more small favor. She needed him to build her a storage box to store some old books and a few other things. He was happy to help out, and she gave him specific dimensions for the box. It had to be six feet long, three feet wide, and two feet deep. So, Ishmael built the box and delivered it as promised, and Dorothea asked him to come back the next day to help her move it to a storage unit. So when he returned, the box was filled, because it was heavy, and the lid was nailed shut. He loaded it onto the truck, and then him and Dorothea headed to the storage depot. On the way to the depot, she asked him to pull over at an unofficial dump site along Garden Highway in Sutter County. She had changed her mind about keeping the stuff in the box and told him to dump it in the river. Which, obviously, Ishmael was very confused by this request. But Dorothea just insisted it was just junk. So he pulled it off of the truck bed and then left it there. Dorothea continued to tell people that Everson was in Los Angeles and that she wrote letters to his family and said he hadn't been in touch because he was very sick. Meanwhile, she kept cashing his pension checks and taking in new tenants. On January 1st, 1986, less than two months after she and Ishmael had dumped the wooden box filled with her unwanted junk, two fishermen were out on the river when they noticed a terrible stench. Half submerged in the water, they found a long wooden box, which was the source of this awful smell. Thinking it looked a little too much like a coffin, they decided to call the police. And when officers arrived on the scene, they pulled the box from the water and pried it open. An officer carefully lifted the lid and pushed it back onto the ground, and the foul stench was so overwhelming that everyone gasped and took a step back. Inside, they found the badly decomposed corpse of a man wearing nothing but underwear and a wristwatch, and the body was wrapped in a white sheet secured with a black electrical tape. The decomposition had progressed well past the point of being able to identify the body, and he was listed as John Doe. It would take another three years before investigators finally identified the man as 77-year-old Everson Theodore Gilma. Early in 1986, a social worker named Peggy Nickerson had heard of Dorothea's reputation as a caretaker in the community who was willing to take in difficult tenants, including people with severe disabilities or mental illness. She hosted Alcoholics Anonymous meetings at the boarding house and offered recovering alcoholics and drug addicts a safe place to stay. She even helped tenants sign up for social security benefits and assisted them with managing their finances. Over the next two years, Peggy sent 19 of her clients to live with Dorothea, and other local social workers did the same, sending clients who were rejected from other places for being verbally or physically abusive or for having a criminal history, because everyone at Dorothea's house was welcome to stay. By now, she had completely changed her appearance to immerse herself in the role of everyone's beloved grandma. She wore vintage clothes and large glasses and let her hair go gray. Dorothea then became a philanthropist for Sacramento's Hispanic community, contributing to scholarships and charities. She welcomed members of the community to extravagant holiday parties at Christmas and Easter, inviting local politicians and social workers to join the festivities, along with her tenants and people from area shelters. She had a nonstop carousel of new tenants and housed at least 40 individuals who were referred to as shadow people or those from marginalized groups who had been forgotten about or discarded by society. They often had no family or friends to take care of them, and they credit Dorothea with saving their lives. 
Each month, she collected and sorted their mail, cashed any benefits checks, and gave each tenant a small allowance, keeping the rest of the expenses. Some of her tenants spent the money at a local bar and were often confronted by the police based on anonymous tips. And depending on the situation, these tips could lead to them being arrested or jailed for up to 30 days. Parole agents visited Dorothea's home at least 15 times during this period, responding to various complaints. A condition of her release was to keep away from the elderly and to avoid handling government checks. Though she was doing both, and agents never cited her for any violations. When social workers like Peggy Nickerson called to check up on their clients, Dorothea sometimes said they were out of town or moved without notice. This happened over and over again, and Peggy was starting to get suspicious. Because how many people just up and leave without much warning? A 77-year-old tenant named Betty Palmer left for a routine doctor's appointment on August 19, 1986, and never returned. A few weeks later, Dorothea used Betty's ID to collect a benefit check. In February 1987, 78-year-old Leona Carpenter was sent to Dorothea's boarding house after being released from the hospital. Leona was told she could sleep on the couch until a room was available, but she disappeared long before ever getting her own room. That July, 16-year-old James Gallup was released from the hospital and into Dorothea's care. He had survived a heart attack and then spent months in the hospital recovering from surgery to remove a brain tumor. A tenant named Carol Durning overheard a fight between Dorothea and James. Dorothea was insisting she handle his finances so he could focus on recovery, but James refused. Later, he told Carol that he was tired all the time from drugs that Dorothea was making him take. Soon after, though, he disappeared, and Carol never saw him again. In October 1987, 64-year-old Vera Faye Martin moved into the boarding house, and within a short time, her room was empty, and she too was gone. In February 1988, Dorothea was visited by a young outreach counselor with Volunteers of America named Judy Moyes. Judy was looking for a suitable housing for a legal immigrant who had moved to the U.S. with his mom and sister in 1962. He was known in the local community as Bert Montoya, and was often seen strolling down the street, mumbling to himself in Spanish, or even talking to trees. He was eccentric and had some intellectual disabilities, but he didn't drink or do drugs. Judy discovered that his full legal name was Alvaro Jose Rafael Gonzalez Montoya, and he was entitled to benefit checks. For almost a year, Judy had helped him track down his official ID and social security number so he could receive his benefits. Another counselor had recommended Dorothea's house as an option for Bert, so on February 1st, 1988, Judy went for a visit with a friend. They were greeted by a kindly old lady with gray hair and no teeth. Dorothea apologized for how she looked and explained that she had ordered new dentures that hadn't come in yet. The blue and white two-story Victorian house was a little cluttered inside, filled with random knickknacks, porcelain dolls, and lace dollies covered every table and shelf. But everything was clean and well kept, and the house was on a quiet street with lots of trees, and it had a lovely garden. Dorothea said she was a widow, and like Bert, she was Hispanic, and an immigrant born and raised in Mexico. This seemed like the perfect place for Bert. So Judy made all the arrangements, and Bert moved in to Dorothea's house two days later. It would be a few weeks before he got his first check, and in the meantime, Dorothea covered his expenses got him new clothes, and made sure he was well-fed and taking his antipsychotic medication. It didn't take long for him to stop mumbling and start using full sentences. And Dorothea took him along on errands to get him used to being around people. And it didn't take long for him to start referring to her as Mama. In March, she took him to the Social Security Administration building downtown, and she explained to the staff member that Bert was intellectually disabled and unable to handle his own finances and requested his benefits come directly to her. She listed herself as his cousin on the paperwork, and sure enough, the request was approved. She started receiving $637 a month to care for Bert, which is about $1,450 in today's money. A little while after their trip downtown, the other tenants stopped seeing Bert come around, and when they asked Dorothea where he was, she told them he had gone on a trip to Mexico to visit his family. At some point, Dorothea had hired a man known only by Chief to work as her live-in handyman at the boarding house. Chief was a homeless alcoholic with nowhere else to go, 
And soon after he moved in, she started claiming that she had adopted him. Everyone in the neighborhood knew Chief, and they were glad he had found a nice place to stay. Dorothea had him do odd jobs around the house, like digging out the basement floor, hauling the dirt away, and installing a fresh concrete slab. Then she had him take down the garage in the backyard and install a concrete slab over the spot as well. When Chief suddenly disappeared, though, the neighbors noticed. And for the first time, they were suspicious about what was really going on inside the boarding house. In May 1988, neighbors started to notice a sickly sweet smell coming from Dorothea's property. She said the smell was from fish emulsion, an organic garden fertilizer. But the smell kept getting worse and even attracted flies. Dorothea changed her story a few times, claiming that rats had died under her floorboard and then that the sewer had backed up. She dumped bags of lime and gallons of bleach into her yard, and the house was filled with a thick fog of lemon-scented air freshener at all times. When Peggy Nickerson came by to check on her clients, she noticed the awful smell and overheard Dorothea yelling and cursing at a tenant. Peggy was already suspicious of Dorothea after several of her clients seemed to disappear from the house. They might have moved away, as Dorothea had said, but Peggy decided it was time to stop referring anyone to the boarding house. Judy Moyes was getting suspicious too, and after Bert Montoya's disappearance, she tried to track him down with no luck. Dorothea paid another tenant, Donald Anthony, to call Judy, posing as Bert's brother-in-law, and tell her that he moved out of state. But when Donald made the call, he used his own name instead of his brother-in-law's name. It was at this point that Judy notified the police and finally filed a missing person report for Bert. Things are just getting wilder and wilder. All these elderly people and disabled people are disappearing without a trace. And yet people are starting to question what's really happening to them. So before we get into any more of this crazy story, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. This summer is thankfully showing welcoming signs of a more normal life ahead. Finally, you can get back to enjoying life's little pleasures, like smiling at your neighbor, seeing a movie, and going to the post office. Okay, some parts of normal life aren't so great, but with Stamps.com, you can skip those annoying trips to the post office and save on postage. With Stamps.com, they bring all of the U.S. Postal and UPS shipping services right to your computer. They make it easy for small businesses just like mine to mail and ship without needing to take a trip to the post office. Not only that, you can print official U.S. postage and shipping labels 24-7, so there's no hours, without having to leave your desk or buy any fancy equipment, because all you need is a computer and a standard printer. And once your mail or packages are ready to go, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. It's that simple. My CBD company, Higher Love Wellness, we use stamps.com for all of our shipping to our customers, and not only have they made it super easy for us to ship things all over the country, but they have saved us so much money because with stamps.com, you can get 40% off of USPS rates and up to 66% off UPS shipping rates, which is absolutely amazing and honestly unheard of. So it's no wonder that stamps.com has saved nearly 1 million small business owners like mine time and money. So stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. Why not? There's no risk. And with my promo code lights out, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale. There's absolutely no long-term commitments or contracts, so why not give it a shot? Just go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in lights out. That's all one word. That's stamps.com and use promo code lights out, and you'll never have to go to the post office again. We all got busy lives, and one of the things that takes a lot of time is planning out your meals for the week, or, you know, takes a lot of money to order delivery. So why not try HelloFresh? HelloFresh has literally saved me so much headaches in going to the store, getting all the ingredients, then coming home, prepping it, and then I end up cooking way more food or buying way more ingredients than I need. I end up wasting food and money at that. But with HelloFresh, they make it super simple. You just go on their website. You get to pick out your meals from their list of endless different recipes, absolutely mouthwatering food and then they ship it right to your door. It's all pre-measured, all ready to go. All you gotta do is follow a little recipe card. It's like six steps and then bada bing, bada boom, you have an absolutely delicious home-cooked meal on your table in as little as 30 minutes. And they even have easy meals too. 
15 to 20 minute dinners, breakfast on the go, and so many more options for your busy lifestyle. I love HelloFresh because there's something for everyone to enjoy with all recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Get better value as HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store and 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal without sacrificing the quality. Best of all, it's flexible. You can stop and start it whenever you want. You can add meals, remove meals, choose your delivery day, food preferences, plan size, or skip a week whenever you need it. I mean, there is no better service out there. It's no wonder that HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit and is my absolute favorite meal kit that is out there. So take advantage of the special offer from HelloFresh today. Go to hellofresh.com slash lightsout14 and use code lightsout14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. What a deal. Go to hellofresh.com slash lightsout14 and use code lightsout14 for up to 14 meals for free plus free shipping today. And our last sponsor for today is Care Of. I don't know where I'd be without Care Of because it has helped me live a much healthier life, especially this past year or two. I started using care of and what I love about care of is that, you know, a lot of people don't know where to start with vitamins and supplements. You don't know what your body needs based on your health and goals. And what's great is that care of has this online quiz that goes in depth. It takes all the guesswork out of vitamins and asks you questions about your diet, your lifestyle and health concerns to help address your specific wellness goals. Cause everybody's got different goals. Every everybody's got different wellness needs. So care of really addresses that. And then you get a personally tailored approach to your unique health needs, and you can actually retake the quiz at any time as your goals and needs change. After you finish the quiz, your expert recommendations are given to you, and you can choose you know, if you want to go with all of them or pick and choose which ones you want. And then what they do is they send it to you in these neat little boxes in these little packets that are great for taking with you on the go or just you know taking every night before you go to bed. And I absolutely love them because it's just so convenient to have them all in one packet. You don't have to have like 18 bottles all lined up next to your bed in order to take your vitamins every night. It's all in these little packets, which is super cool. Best of all, Care of makes it easy with a personalized subscription delivered to your door each month, contact free. So you really never have to worry about running out. It's just there when you run out. Care of also has an app that allows you to track your routine and earn rewards like discounts and free products when you're consistent with taking your vitamins. So get rewarded for being healthy. So take charge of your health and wellness today and get 50% off your first care of order when you go to takecareof.com and enter code lightsout50. Again, you can get 50% off your first care of order. Just go to takecareof.com and enter code lightsout50. So on November 7th, 1988, Detective John Cabrera and a few other officers visited the boarding house to look for Bert. Dorothy invited the officers in and said it was, you know, fine for them to take a look around. And to the officers, she seemed harmless. And the other tenants backed up her story that Bert had just up and moved away. The police were satisfied that she was telling the truth. But before they left, a tenant named John Sharp slipped one of the officers a note that read, She's making me lie for her. When this happened, the officers actually returned to the house a few days later, on November 11th, for another search. This time they noticed a patch of dirt on the southeast corner of the property that looked like it had been recently disturbed. They got permission from Dorothea to dig up the spot, and she even provided an extra shovel. As officers dug, they pulled out shreds of cloth and a strange fleshy material that looked like beef jerky. They then hit something that felt like a tree root and couldn't get past it. When this happened, John Cabrera hopped into the hole to get a closer look. He then gripped the object braced his feet and pulled as hard as he could. And when it finally broke loose, he saw the joint and realized it was a bone. John then jumped out of the hole as fast as he could and told Dorothea that he had just found what he believed to be a human corpse in her yard. And she just acted absolutely shocked and horrified. So they kept digging around and they found a shoe with a piece of foot still inside. And at that point, they decided they needed backup. They then returned the next day with heavy machinery, a full work crew, and a team of forensic anthropologists and representatives from the coroner's office. It was a dreary morning, but a crowd of neighbors and reporters gathered outside the house soon after the crews arrived, and people pushed and shoved each other to get a better view and tried to guess what they were looking for. The crew dug up the rest of the body they had found the day before, 
and put the pieces in a body bag. As the remains were carried out to the coroner's vehicle, the lively crowd grew silent. Dorothea came out into the yard wearing a red overcoat and purple pumps and carrying a pink umbrella. And she asked John if she was under arrest, and he said no. So she asked if she could walk to the Clarion Hotel just a few blocks away to get a cup of coffee. And he agreed and escorted her past the crowd. When Dorothea got to the hotel, she called a cab and went to the bar across town. She drank four Greyhounds, which is a cocktail made with vodka and grapefruit juice, and then took another cab to Stockton. From there, she took a six-hour bus trip to Los Angeles and checked into room 31 of the Royal Viking Motel in downtown LA under the name Dorothea Johansson. She had $3,000 cash in her purse, and for a few days, she only left the room to buy food. It didn't take her long for her to grow restless, though. One afternoon, she put on makeup, got dressed, and took a cab to a bar two miles from the motel. She was way too dressed up for the atmosphere, and everyone in the bar noticed her right away, including Charles Wilgus, a 59-year-old retired carpenter. Dorothea walked over to him and took the stool next to him, and they started chatting. She introduced herself as Donna Johansson and ordered a screwdriver. She told Charles she was from Sacramento and that her husband had died just a month before. So she decided to move to LA for a fresh start. And when the cab dropped her off at her motel, it had driven off with her suitcase. All she had were the clothes she wore and a broken pair of pumps. So she lifted her skirt to show him the broken heel. Charles was charmed by the pretty widow and felt bad that she had been through so much. He told her he could help and took the broken heels to a repair shop across the street. She waited for him at the bar, and when he came back, she said she wanted to repay him. She then asked him how much he received from Social Security each month. And Charles was surprised by this personal question, but he still answered it and said $576 a month. Dorothea told him she could get him a lot more and she knew which forms to use to get the maximum benefits. Charles was intrigued and kept the conversation going, and they ended up talking for hours, and eventually Dorothea suggested they spend Thanksgiving together. If they hit it off, she could move in with him. How convenient. He knew this was a very strange thing to say, but she seemed so genuine, he couldn't help but feel flattered. Before they parted ways, he promised to take her shopping the next day. But when he got home, he couldn't shake the feeling that he knew this woman from somewhere, as he was sure he had seen her before. Later that night, he was watching television when it clicked. He was almost certain he had seen Donna's picture on the news that morning, and her real name was Dorothea Puente, and she was wanted in connection to multiple murders. He was certain it was her, but he couldn't be sure. So instead of calling the police, he called CBS News and talked to Gene Silver, an assignment editor. Gene sensed this was a big scoop and said he'd come over with a picture of the woman for Charles to identify. And once he got Charles to agree that the picture was the same woman he had met in the bar, Gene got a camera crew together and called the police. By November 14th, investigators had dug up the slab of concrete in Dorothea's yard and had found several more bodies. There were seven in total but they believe there are more victims out there. After seeing the story on the news, dozens of people had called in looking for their missing clients, friends, and relatives. Investigators guessed as many as 25 people had disappeared from the boarding house. The first body they dug up was 78-year-old widow, Leona Carpenter, who had disappeared in February 1987. They then found the body of Dorothy Miller, a 64-year-old American Indian and Army veteran who enjoyed reciting poetry. She was buried with her arms duct taped to her chest. The last person to see her alive was her social worker, who left Dorothy relaxing on the front porch of the boarding house smoking a cigarette in October 1987. 78 year old Betty Palmer was last seen in August 1986, and she was buried in the front yard, just a few feet from the sidewalk, wearing a sleeveless white nightgown. Her body was missing a head, hands, and lower legs, and a statue of a saint was buried above her. Benjamin Fink was buried wearing nothing but stripped boxer shorts. The 55-year-old was last seen in April 1988 when another tenant watched him go upstairs with Dorothea, who said she was going to make him, quote-unquote, feel better. They then found 62-year-old James Gallup, who had survived a heart attack and brain tumor before moving into the boarding house. 
Investigators believe that 64-year-old Vera Faye Martin, last seen in the fall of 1987, was buried alive. It looked like she had actually tried to escape the shallow grave she was found in. When they did dig her up, she still had the watch on her wrist, and it was still ticking. Sadly, 51-year-old Bert Montoya, last seen in 1988, was buried beside the house under a newly planted apricot tree. Large concentrations of florazepam, which is used to treat insomnia, were found throughout the soil in the yard. Plus, they found dozens of bottles of prescription drugs inside of the house. The bodies were also all in advanced stages of decomposition. In a few cases, the internal organs had literally melted together, making examining the bodies and finding a cause of death very challenging. The body of 77-year-old Everson Gilmuth, which had been discovered in a makeshift coffin in a river nearly three years earlier, was finally identified through x-rays. Though no cause of death could be determined, investigators linked his death to his fiancée, Dorothea Puente. Investigators also believe that Dorothea was responsible for the death of her friend and business partner, 61-year-old Ruth Monroe, in April 1982, which was initially ruled a suicide. In the house, they found a note with the first initial of each victim and how much money they received in benefits per month. It added up to about $5,000, or about $11,375 in today's money. There was an envelope with checks, bank statements, and social security cards that belonged to the victims, as well as IDs with Dorothea's picture, but someone else's name. A handwriting expert confirmed that Dorothea had signed and cashed over 60 benefit checks after the recipients had died. By the time they realized she was responsible for the murders, she had already fled. And realizing their mistake, very quickly, the police launched a statewide manhunt and even brought in the FBI to help and find her. They searched bus depots, train stations, and airports and discovered that she had booked a flight to LA but never boarded. The false lead apparently worked because investigators ruled out Los Angeles early on and didn't bother searching there. But on November 17th, an editor from CBS News named Gene Silver contacted the police claiming to have an eyewitness who had several drinks with Dorothea Puente in a bar in downtown Los Angeles. So around 10.30 p.m. that night, the police arrived at the Royal Viking Motel along with news cameras and knocked on door 31. And when Dorothea answered, an officer demanded to see her ID. She then proceeded to hand them a driver's license with the name Dorothea Montalvo which was the last name of her fourth husband, Pedro Angel Montalvo. In the motel room, they found silk chiffon dresses, multiple bottles of $110 Giorgio perfume, and $3,042.55 in an unmarked envelope. Dorothea was then arrested and taken by plane back to Sacramento, where she was charged with the murder of Bert Montoya and held without bail. Once back in Sacramento, the police interrogated her extensively. I'm going to go ahead and include some clips of interrogation footage from the police because it's very interesting to hear her just speak and her mannerisms. Just note that this footage is from quite a long time ago, so it's not the best quality of audio, but if you listen closely, you should be able to hear everything pretty well. Who is lying to me, Dorothea? Well, I'm not. I mean, there's well, a lot of well, things, I Dorothea, know, that I, I don't understand. There's, I don't know where the man was going to take him. Okay, but I mean, there's a lot. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of inconsistency there. You know, we, we go and talk to you. You're real good about it. And then we ask you for permission. Mm-hmm. You, you didn't even have to give us permission to look, but you were cooperating. You said, sure. You gave us permission to dig around in the yard and look around. And then we dig, and lo and behold, we find what is looks like the remains of a human being, clothing and all. But... If, if it was, if it was Alvaro, you know, Bert. No, I don't think it's Alvaro. Okay, we know there was a trench. You dug a small trench right here. How deep was that? Maybe 18 inches, 20 inches. Foot and a half? Uh-huh. Okay, and then you didn't find anything? You just buried it? Uh-huh. And then later on you laid concrete over the whole thing? Yeah, I threw some, like, if you look in my kitchen, I have one bucket where I put my coffee grounds, eggshells and stuff. In fact, you'll find that all over the yard. Okay. You know. As the investigation continued and they gathered more evidence, Dorothea was eventually charged with a total of nine murders. 46-year-old Ishmael Flores was charged as an accessory to the murder of Everson Gilmuth for building the wooden box and helping Dorothea dispose of the body. But the charges didn't stick because the statute of limitations had expired. 
The prosecutors opted not to charge her with forgery to make the case as simple as possible for the jury to follow, as they wanted a guilty verdict for murder and were seeking the death penalty. On March 31, 1989, Dorothea pleaded innocent to all nine counts of murder, which wasn't surprising to anyone because during her interrogation, Dorothea had said she was innocent the entire time. Are there any other bodies? I haven't killed anyone. My conscience is not bothering me, but I have nothing to hide. I'm an like old lady. I couldn't drag a body any place. Obviously, this was a sensational case that just exploded in the media, and anyone who had ever met Dorothea Puente was tracked down and interviewed by reporters and journalists. And each story was more unbelievable than the next. For example, when a neighbor mentioned that Dorothea made tamales at Christmas, a reporter for the National Enquirer asked if the meat tasted funny, implying that it might have been made of human flesh. She was nicknamed the Death House Landlady, and her court-appointed defense attorneys argued the biased media coverage made it impossible for her to get a fair trial. So they moved her trial to Monterey County, and after years of delays, it finally began in February 1993 with a jury of eight men and four women. Dorothea arrived in the court looking like a sweet old grandma in an old-fashioned dress, a string of pearls, thick glasses, and perfectly coiffed hair. Prosecutor John O'Mara argued that Dorothea was one of the most cold and calculating female serial killers the country has ever seen and called over 130 witnesses to prove his case. He claimed that she hired reformed convicts or her own tenants to dig large holes in her yard. Then she drugged her victims until they overdosed, then suffocated them and wrapped them up in sheets of plastic and threw their bodies in the freshly dug graves. Witnesses came forward who had been hired to dig the graves and who lived in the boarding house. According to former tenants, they weren't allowed to touch the phone or the mail. Dorothea had a well-stocked liquor cabinet upstairs and often went out drinking in bars, but no one who lived in the house was allowed to drink, even if they weren't a recovering alcoholic. She cooked huge meals for breakfast at 6.30 a.m. and dinner at 3.30 p.m. But if someone missed mealtime, they weren't allowed to step foot in the kitchen and went hungry. A former tenant named Homer Myers lived at the boarding house for two years and had unknowingly dug some of the graves. When Dorothea insisted he signed papers allowing her to cash his benefits check, he refused and believed that decision saved his life. Other former tenants testified about being forced to take unfamiliar drugs. An employee at a local detox center, William Johnson, had treated Bert Montoya, who said Dorothea gave him medicine that he didn't like to take. William confronted Dorothea and she flipped out, telling him to take Bert back to the detox center. Bert thought he might be better off there, but William assured him he was safe at Dorothea's house, something that he'll regret and live with for the rest of his life. The prosecutor held up the pictures of each victim for the jury. The first picture was taken when they were alive and the second was their dead body. And as the jury members recoiled, Dorothea remained perfectly still and stared at each photo with absolutely no reaction or emotion at all. Other tenants saw a different side of Dorothea. The defense called multiple witnesses on her behalf who talked about how kind and generous she was. She bought her tenants clothes and cigarettes using her own money, fed stray cats in the neighborhood and taught a disabled tenant to ride a tricycle so he could be more independent. Patty Casey, a 54-year-old cab driver, was a friend of Dorothea's who took her out on a few times a week to run errands. According to Patty, Dorothea confessed that she had gotten multiple facelifts and had been lying about her age for years, saying she was 59 when she was really 71. She also told her about her four failed marriages and that she had lied about being a widow. Despite all of this, Patty looked up to Dorothea because she was clever and savvy, but also deeply caring. The defense claimed that all the people buried at the boarding house had died of natural causes Dorothea knew she was violating her parole, so instead of calling paramedics, she buried the bodies in the yard. And once they were dead, she saw no harm in cashing their checks to help pay for her other tenants. In other words, she may have lied and taken money that didn't belong to her, but she wasn't the cold-blooded serial killer the prosecutor was making her out to be. Multiple psychologists testify that Dorothea's traumatic, abusive childhood had affected her judgment and ability to tell right from wrong but it also motivated her to dedicate her life to helping the less fortunate. Her judgment was at its worst when she was under a great deal of stress, such as when she was caring for sick and dying tenants. John O'Mara closed the case for the prosecution by telling the jury, 
death is the only appropriate penalty. The defense asked the jury to have compassion for her and give her life without the possibility of parole instead of sentencing her to death. When the trial ended in July 1993, jury members had heard from 153 witnesses and had been presented with 3,500 pages of evidence. Even though the prosecution had forensic evidence that all nine bodies contained traces of the sleeping florazepam, they had no eyewitnesses linking Dorothea directly to any of the murders or burials, and it was far from a slam dunk. No one knew which way the verdict was going to go, and after a month of deliberation, the jury was deadlocked and asked the judge for further instruction. The defense tried to get a mistrial, but instead the judge told the members of the jury to go back and try again. And on August 26, they finally reached a verdict. The jury came back and found Dorothea Puente guilty of the murders of Leona Carpenter, Dorothy Miller, and Benjamin Fink. And while the verdict was read, Dorothea showed no emotion whatsoever. However, the jury couldn't reach a decision on the other six murders and a judge declared a mistrial on those charges. On December 11, 1993, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and before she was led away, she turned to her attorney and said, I didn't kill anyone. 64-year-old Dorothea Puente was sent to Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California, and she spent the rest of her life claiming she was innocent. In 1998, she started corresponding with a writer named Shane Bugby, which was a relationship that continued for several years. Eventually, Dorothea started sending him her recipes, and in 2004, Shane published Cooking with a Serial Killer Recipes from Dorothea Puente, and the book included over 50 recipes and random artwork Dorothea had done while in prison. After the trial, an independent county agency published a report, Sins of Omission, and detailed the mistakes made by the Sacramento Police Department regarding Dorothea Puente. The report referenced the parole agents who had failed to notice after 15 visits to the boarding house that she was violating her parole, and the police officers who let her literally stroll away from the crime scene after finding a dead body in her yard. On March 27, 2011, Dorothea died in prison from natural causes at the age of 82 years old. The former boarding house at 1426 F Street has attracted a lot of attention over the years. It was a part of the Sacramento Old City Association Home Tour in 2013, and it was featured in a 2015 documentary short called The House is Innocent, and it was open for public tours during the local film festival. Also in 2015, a crew from Ghost Adventures investigated the property, which was reportedly haunted by Dorothea and her victims. The current owners allowed film crews inside the house in April 2020 for the Quibi series Murder House Flip and again in June 2020 for a 10-minute documentary with 60 Second Docs. Detective John Cabrera has said that investigators always believed Dorothea must have had help at least moving and burying the bodies, but they've never found evidence of who that accomplice might have been. If that isn't chilling, I don't know what is. That's my thought the entire time is, how did this relatively old woman carry these dead bodies around and bury them in holes? Like, Yeah, I mean, there's no way that physically, her alone like physically. physically unless she's just got mad strength. That nah. We don't know about that. It's like, she's like pumping iron in her free time or something <laughs> like Jesus. Or on steroids How is she or doing something? this? Yeah. So many bodies, man. That's a lot of people. Yeah, to me, it seems like maybe some tenants in her house was helping her in some kind of way. But well, there was a one where she put him in a box and then tricked him into yeah putting in there. So I could see her. She's a master manipulator, mm-hmm. as most serial killers are. I think she's just the classic profile for a serial killer, and just and I mean, she is schizophrenic too. So oh, yeah, right. I mean, who who really knows what what happened with that? But I I do think there's clearly people out there that did assist. and maybe there is a straight up accomplice that just has never been caught i mean they didn't do the greatest job in right. investigating this this case at all they literally walked let her walk away mm-hmm. from a corpse found in her yard she's like yeah, i don't know bye yeah <laughs> and they just let it. so i think there's definitely some things that were missed with this and maybe there is an accomplice still out there that needs to be brought to justice for their role in the crimes i mean right. it seems like 
seems pretty like straightforward as how she kind of you know committed the murders and planned them out and you know made sure that they signed over her you know their benefits checks to her and then she just cashed in Mm -hmm. it was all about the money i mean she didn't care about she was like oh you know they're they're gonna die soon anyway so why not took i need to take their money yeah yeah it's just like it's it's sick oh yeah i mean she's sick clearly you know she's got mental illness and who knows what else but i think also it was just she made the conscious decision to you know this is how I'm going to take people's money and here's here's the way I'm going to do it and nobody's going to stop me. Right. And, and I think she knew during this time she could play the system because no one was to suspect like an elderly woman would right, be doing Right. This. She clearly knew that she was going to be able to fly under the radar yeah. because of the way she looked and it's just <laughs> less, <laughs> so deceiving. The lesson to be learned here is can't judge a book by its cover. Or, Bingo. You, you know. can't judge a book by its cover. I mean, the innocent looking grandma could be a fucking serial killer. Right that's the moral of the story that's, like that's scary how scary is that that's though? really like, scary it really makes you makes you wonder man like you know i forget there's some statistic out there like of the number of people that will run across a serial killer or a killer in their lives it's it's kind of scary to think about i bet that like you could just be you know going to the grocery store right. and pass by an elderly lady in the aisle and you're like, oh, what a sweet grandma. She's yeah. probably like my grandma. And, right. You know, just here to get bake cookies for her mm-hmm. for her grandkids. And yet she's getting food to take back to her boarding house where she murders elderly and disabled people for their money. I mean, it's, Terrible. it's just crazy. It yeah. just makes you think like how many other right. serial killers like her are, are out there. Have flown under the radar. We're just unsuspecting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very mind. Wild, boy. wild case. Yeah definitely have to let us know what you think of dorothea puente a real life monster for sure but that is where we'll wrap up today's episode of lights out podcast hopefully you uh, found this one interesting if you did we'd appreciate it if you subscribe on apple podcasts and youtube if you haven't already give us a like and thumbs up but we will be back next week with another episode and we're going to be going in an even darker direction so get ready for that i know we are But until next time, lights out, everybody.